Welcome to our third session of today on creativity and AI. Please take your seats. We're going to start now. Again, I should mention that uh, we have simultaneous interpreters sitting in the back. Yeah, <laughs> applause for them. I heard that the two of you have sub supported Ars Electronica uh, since or for decades already. Is that true? Nodding, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, um, the focus of uh, the next session is uh, creativity and AI, as already mentioned. Um, creativity has, or typically is defined as a kind of core competence of humankind. So, I'm uh, really interested in the talks we're going to hear now. Um, maybe we can ask for the future whether machines can be creative on their own or if machines uh, can help us at least to be more creative. Um, the first speaker in this session is Kenrick McDowell. Please come to stage, Kenrick. Um, he worked at the intersection of culture and technology for 20 years including collaborations with Nike, with Focus Features and HTC Innovation. And currently, uh, he leads the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program at Google Research, facilitating collaborations between Google's AI researchers, between artists and cultural institutions. And his talk will be on art and high-dimensional life. Thank you. So that, the, the talk will still touch on the theme of art in high dimensional life, but what I did um, was I deformed a presentation that um, I normally give because of some things that I feel very uh, strongly about presenting as soon as possible. So um, just, just wanted to let you guys know, what, know about that. Um, so, but the basic, uh, just the, the most important uh, basic information you need to know about me right now is that I lead this program at Google called Artists and Machine Intelligence. We're based in Google Research, and we bring artists in to work with AI researchers and to develop projects that use AI. Um, I'm going to talk about some of those projects. Many of them are here at Ars Electronica, which is very exciting. And um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I've learned in the process of doing that. And so this is, these are the things that I really want to share with everyone here. Um, I feel very strongly that these need to be shared now. Um, and I'll, hopefully this will not seem too orthogonal to the um, rest of the presentation, but I'm going to kind of keep harping on this set of points. Um, and so, this is a sort of logical structure that I've experienced as I've been working on these projects using artificial intelligence, um, specifically art projects. And the, this, this structure sort of starts with an observation and, and digs deeper into some of the underlying thinking behind the projects and, and some of the challenges that we face when we try to understand the impact that AI will have on uh, things like the city, things like the countryside, things like um, our social organization, which are areas of research that we also touch on in the program. And the basic insight here is that new tools generate new languages, and these new languages that they generate reveal new relations, new structural relations, new power relations that require new contracts of various kinds, new ways of understanding each other, new, power, new contracts between individuals, new contracts um, between individuals and society, new social contracts. And the underlying structure of any social contract is an ontology, ultimately. You know, maybe an ideology first, but ultimately an ontology. And the provocation that I'm going to be kind of harping on over and over in this uh, in this presentation is that we need to discover what that is in the 21st century as we enter into this world of intense complexity and multiple ongoing crises, whether they be extinction or climate or social justice. So um, with that, I'll sort of give you, start giving some real concrete examples and, and uh, expect to see this slide again. So 
we're talking about tools, right? AI is ultimately a technology, it's a tool, and in the context of my work and the work I do with artists and the work my team does with artists, we use that to make art. But let's go back to a very old tool, this hand axe, which is 300,000 years old. There is a researcher named Dietrich Stout at Emory University who's used MRI machines to observe the changes in people's brains when they are taught to make these stone tools in the way that were, they were made 300,000 years ago. This is what he says, the results of our imaging studies on stone tool making led us to propose that neural circuits, including the inferior frontal gyrus, underwent changes to adapt to the demands of paleolithic tool making and then were co-opted to support primitive forms of communication using gestures and perhaps vocalizations. The claim here being, or the implication being that it was the making of these tools that resulted in neural changes that allowed for language to emerge. So what that means is that our tools change our brains and in that as they do, new cognitive faculties emerge, in this case language. Um, to talk a little bit about lens-based tools and image making or art history, we can take a look at this digitally reprojected image of the anamorphic skull in Hans Holbein the Younger's painting, The Ambassadors. It looks like that when it's not reprojected. Uh, it's pretty clear, based on some research that David Hockney has done, that the lenses were used in the production of these. It's basically impossible to do this without a lens. So that basic, that that makes this some kind of photograph, a hand-assisted photograph, but a photograph nonetheless. So within the history of photography, you can move from this type of work to the daguerreotype, to conceptual photography like Ronnie Horn's project, You Are the Weather, here, to projects like Mike Tyka's uh, Hallucinations of Facenet, which can be seen out here. What that process describes in terms of tools is the hand moving to the lens, moving to the CCD, uh, the, digital, the mechanism that allows digital cameras to work, moving to the big data archive, which is what is used in a neural net uh, training process. So the face net hallucinations that Mike Taika has produced that you can view out here are a sort of manifestation of the big data archive, and you can see a sort of expansion of photography from something that's done by the hand through something that's facilitated with the cloud infrastructure and ultimately neural nets. So the question, uh, you know, about cognition and, and what might emerge as a byproduct of this new tool, tools create modes of cognition that change neural structures. Representational tools are increasing in depth and complexity, the hand, the lens, the CCD, the big data archive, the neural net, and AI representations themselves are highly multidimensional. So what new language does AI art produce? This thought comes from uh, an intuition that I had from observing all of this AI art and working with artists that make it and understanding that there's a certain type of uh, mental model of multidimensionality that comes from understanding the mathematics behind these and engaging in the process of training neural nets. And so the original impetus for this lecture, Art and High Dimensional Life, was that this perception of multidimensionality could be a new type of language or cog mode of cognition that would emerge from using these tools and that I myself was kind of observing in everyday life after engaging over and over with these um, artworks. I'm trying to push that into the space of an ontological discussion that we might perhaps be able to use to develop some kind of consensus with which we can form new social contracts so that we can solve some of these wicked problems that are confronting us in terms of climate change and uh, extinction and social justice. Um, just as an aside, this is a 12-dimensional hypercube drawn by an outsider artist named Vince Rourke, who I met in Kansas City. Um, I bought this from him in 2003. He uh, got electroshock therapy for nerves and uh, nervous, tr nervous effects that were coming from smoking cessation and in the process started hallucinating these, um, these multidimensional structures. So this is just a sort of example of one way of perceiving multidimensionality. Um, this is another example. This is Trippy Squirrel. That was the sort of canonical leaked image on Reddit that kicked off the deep dream phenomenon. So um, we're talking about languages, right? And so there's this language of hallucination that has emerged as a trope or a method within AI art. As speaking of deep dream, you've probably seen this image before. Um, Memo did a really good job of explaining, hopefully you were in the previous lecture, um, so I won't
harp on it too much, but um, this is a process whereby neural networks can be essentially run backwards to produce imagery that um, represents their internal state. That internal state is modeled in these neural net structures, so I had to turn this sideways to fit it on the slide because these are deep neural nets. Um, the depth comes from the stacking and layering of these structures. Neural nets have existed since the 90s, but it was only after GPU uh, advances in GPUs enabled their type of vector processing to be done on a large scale that they've become um, much more commonly employed in machine learning. The way these things are trained is by taking large data sets. Um, so you're looking at a sample of the ImageNet data set. ImageNet is what was used in some of the Deep Dream hallucinations and these this uh, training process, I don't know if Memo spoke about this, but the training process here is that you sort of show the neural net these images with labels and you, you iterate um, a set of weights until the system can effectively recognize the labeled data. So that's a little bit of a technical explanation. I'll show you these videos so you can kind of see more clearly um, what I'm talking about. So this is going to show an illustration of how object recognition works in a neural net. So you, the, the, the recognition that is shown in image, various features um, are, re are recognized, and that results in the selection of a final category, in which this case is very generic. It says it's a bird. Um, so in, the, in this kind of new method of hallucination that I'm, we're talking about here, you simply run that process backwards and generate from the same features that are recognized in this iterative fashion, the way Memo described drawing what you see in a cloud and kind of retracing it over and over. So you end up with something that looks like a bird, but the way that it's perceived by a machine, not the type of bird that we recognize. Here are some examples of some of these categories. Um, these, these are hallucinations that illustrate categories of image recognition. Again, these don't look like what we think of when we see a, a, an ant or a measuring cup, but there are enough features within these images that um, they can be recognized as such by the machine. This is where the multidimensionality comes in. So in order to sort of understand how these neural net structures that look a little bit like this, how they actually work, what's actually happening mathematically, we can take the notion of linear separability and try to understand that. So if you look at the image on the far left, you can see there are, there are um, I'm sorry, if you look at the image in the middle, you can see that there are open circles and there are filled circles, right? And there's a red line that separates them. These are very easy to separate because they're, they're on two different sides of this, this square. And the formula for that circle, I'm sorry, the formula for the line that separates them is very simple. If, as in the case of the leftmost image, one of the dots migrates into the other cluster of open dots, one of the filled in dots has moved into the cluster of open dots, in order to separate those with a line, we need a curve, which is a more complex mathematical structure. Uh, if, if we want to make it very easy to separate them, we can actually se separate them by moving them into three-dimensional space. Um, and separating them with a plane. And what you have with these neural nets is data that exists not in three dimensions, but in like upwards of you know, 500 or 500,000 dimensions that has been linearly separated by a hyperplane. So that's, a, again, more like technical mathematical jargon, but the point is that if we want to sort of separate uh, pieces that are clustered very tightly together in three-dimensional space and 500-dimensional space. It can be done, but it's done with this topological structure, which is measured and folded into these weights. And so you can see these, these uh, circles here are connected by lines, and each of those lines has a number. Those are weights. And so um, what those represent is actually a, a topology, which is a little bit like this or even like this. So I'm sorry to sort of like dump a lot of math here, but I think it's really important that we understand um, 
what we're experiencing because the sort of that because the new language that can emerge or the new cognitive faculty that can emerge from engaging with these structures has a lot to do with that and it has a lot to do with that multidimensionality. Um, so in the case of language, more specifically, we can, we can dial in um, actual linguistic examples of this hallucinatory technique um, using something called long short-term memories. This project, uh, this, is a, this is an image from a novel that was written by an AI attached to a car. Uh, the AI was created by Ross Goodwin, and the project is called Word Car. You can see a documentary about it in the AI room over here. Um, I'll read this out loud because the type is pretty small. But this is um, an image that was seen by a surveillance camera that uh, fed into this neural net. And what the neural net output at the moment, you know, this was March 27th at 5.44 in the afternoon. White clouds and blue sky spread out on the road. And in the storm, there was a silvery star-like streak of sleeping children. A pair of jeans were still on the table and the long black stains of hair shone in the cloud of flowers. So this feels um, a little bit Dadaistic or surrealistic. Here's an image of the surveillance camera. Here's the car. Uh, in this, we drove from New York to New Orleans, and uh, a lot of the trip was through an industrial corridor that was um, in the process of sort of decaying, let's say. Um, this project really, it gave an, it gave us an opportunity to think about and explore what machine perception really is right now, and the use of the surveillance camera, the other signals that came in to feed the AI, so the, uh, the GPS data, the time, uh, the Foursquare API, these were the senses of the machine, of the AI, as it was moving through this industrial corridor, as it was moving from New York to New Orleans. So the the what we, were, what we gave the machine to sort of perceive was largely conditioned by the needs of that corridor, which happened to be, you know, it was meeting the needs of people that are traveling. There's a lot of fast food restaurants. Um, it was largely about the freeway, red and white flags, and the stars were like a curtain of paper, like a broad stream of flowers. Um, another example where you can see a little bit more of the sort of limited scope of the machine perception here the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino Biloxi, a hotel in Biloxi, a high fisherman with a starry face and a stub of a coat on his face and his shirt looking boldly across his mouth. Um, I wrote about this in the Ars Electronica catalog. It's also available on our website, uh, the, the Medium blog for Artists and Machine Intelligence. Um, you know, the language that's being developed here is, is, as I was saying, largely conditioned by sort of the needs of a capitalistic, uh, you know, automobile-oriented, uh, geographically, you know, situated, geographically situated around a freeway, this type of situation. Um, and if you want to imagine, you know, artificial intelligence, if you, I don't think it's necessarily the most productive way to think about it, but a lot of people feel that it's helpful for them to think about AI as a sort of sentient, emergent intelligence. And if we were to think about it that way, I think it would be pretty important to imagine that, you know, what, it, what are its senses? And if the senses are, uh, you know, largely conditioned by the needs uh, of um, food distribution, synthetic food distribution along the freeway, you know, essentially the needs of techno-capitalism, I think we need to be um, pretty pretty honest with ourselves about what kind of entity is emerging in that space and the language that it's speaking. Um, this was also, this project also tied in kind of uh, fairly deeply with uh, the notion of uh, um, American literary road trip. So the precedents uh, that we, you know, considered as we worked on it were on the road, um, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. These were sort of references that the artist was bringing to it. So um, if you're interested in exploring that, please check out the essay. Um, again, this is, this is uh, an example of relation, new relations that emerge from working with this tool. So the tool is exposing sort of in, uh, structures within our, within our social system, structures within our economic system. Uh, but sometimes the relations that are mapped by these are not like such explicitly social relations. They can be, be literally formal relations, and that is the case in this piece by Rafiq Anadol, which you can also see here. This is some previous work he did at the Disney Concert Hall in LA. But the piece that I'm talking about is a piece we did with him um, 
that uses the archive of the Salt Museum in Istanbul. So we used machine learning to map uh, 1.7 million items of, of this archive into an immersive interactive uh, installation called Archive Dreaming, which you can experience here. Um, it's, a, it's a 360 projection mapped installation with moving images. You can interact with the archive. Um, and I'm going to show some slides that show the... Yeah, so this is sort of how the, the, the relational uh, element is surfaced. These, these lines illustrate features that are detected by the machine learning and mapped between the items in the archive so that when you experience the archive, you're moving through this three-dimensional space. And so this space is actually um, a much higher dimensional space that's been mapped down into three dimensions using something called T-stochastic neighbor embedding. There's an interface. This, in the original installation, there's a, there's a browsable interface. And so this is a way of um, working within the archive um, through a new mode of perception where this very large scale data set is kind of visualized all at once. And so you can see the, the structure of it, the underlying structure of the archive. Additionally, Mike Taika, uh, who collaborated with Rafiq, um, w used the neural net, the latent space of this neural net, to generate a um, series of hallucinations of content that could exist in the archive. So statistically or probabilistically or within the sort of multi-dimensional multi space of that archive, these things could exist, but they actually don't. And um, there's a mode within the presentation where you can view these. So I'm going to, oops, I'm going to quickly um, wrap up because I'm getting towards the end of the time here. But again, I want to express that the need, so as we move into these spaces of uh, using new tools, understanding the new languages that emerge from them, looking at the new relations that are implied by those languages or that already exist but are surfaced by those languages, we find ourselves with a need for new social contracts or new contracts of many different kinds. So, for example, um, looking at the way uh, individuals interact with these AI systems, we don't, have an, we don't have a bill of rights, we don't have a social contract that includes these type of automated decision-making processes. So, for example, um, crime prediction is uh, one of the more common use cases that we um, talk about when we want to uh, explain sort of emergent potential power relations or, or abuses of power or automation of abuses of power. Um, we can also talk about um, some. This this just came out today. There's someone developed a project that can that presume that presumes to uh, determine people's sexual preference by looking at their photographs um, with some degree of accuracy. And so when it comes to sort of how we're interpolated by power or how we are named by power, uh, there is a certain implication of these tools. And that, you know, I think this paradigm is actually a little bit, it's funny to apply these types of paradigms to a multidimensional space, right? And so I'll just quickly go through this study that my director, Blaise Aguari Arcas, did around gender and identity. This is a self-reported um, questionnaire that has 65 questions. It took about two and a half minutes to complete it, focused on gender, sexuality, identity, and, and presentation. It was filled out by uh, mechanical Turkers. And um, I'm not going to go into all the questions here because I'm a little bit running out of time. but. The important thing, I think, to surface is that when you look at the responses and when you map them in this 65-dimensional space, you end up with um, something that, can, that needs to be flattened down. And so how we do that mathematically or linguistically, you know, currently um, we're kind of having a cu cultural conversation about doing that in a binaristic model, right? So if we, move, if we use something called singular value decomposition to sort of move it into a one or zero kind of space, you end up with a very strong binary representation of these features of uh, personal identification and personal expression of gender. But if you move, um, if you move, if you move into a spectral representation, you can start to see uh, that the peaks are still there, but you have more of a middle ground, right? You have a little bit more of a fluidity between those peaks. 
And if you move into a, th a three-dimensional representation that done with this Tisney technique, so taking a 65-dimensional space and flattening it down into three dimensions, um, you actually end up with something much more weird and blobby and hard to sort of verbalize with the existing language that we have. And so there is, again, this deformation of our existing um, contract about how we're interpolated by power, how our gender is expressed verbally, when we start to look at it through this multidimensional model. And so the idea of high dimensionality within these systems, or the notion that these high dimensionality within these, within these systems can, can deform our perceptions, our social contracts, and ultimately our ontology, um, I think is really the point that I'm trying to get across here. So I'm going to have to skip the very last bits here, but just I want to reiterate, we're working with new tools that force us or they generate within our discourse and within our work new languages, and these new languages reveal new relations, re relations to power, social relations, relations to the objects themselves, relations between the objects themselves, and those require new contracts, social contracts, um, contracts with com between individuals individuals and companies, contracts between individuals and society, and in order, to under, in order to form those contracts, because they really don't exist, you know, to use the gender example, we have a very binaristic way of contractually understanding that between each other. Uh, in order to get to a new working contract, we need a new ontology, and that ontology is, um, is up for grabs, but my, my very strongly felt conviction is that in order to solve the problems that we're facing, whether they're the um, the destruction of our infrastructure by these climate crises or by the rise of fascism or um, the mass extinction of the, of the animals that support us, uh, we need to tackle this ontological problem. Uh, and if we can't do that, we can at least try for the social contract. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenrick. Same procedure as before. Please take a seat for the moment. We're going to have a question and answer session again after the next talk, which will be given by Rebecca Fiebrink. She's a senior lecturer at Goldsmith University of London. She holds a PhD in computer science from Princeton University. Her research focuses on creative collaborations between humans and computers. And in this regard, she has worked with companies such as Microsoft Research or Sun Microsystems. She has also co-directed the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. And she's going to talk about machine learning as creative collaborative tool. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? Excellent. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to Ars Electronica for the invitation. Um, usually when I tell people I do work about machine learning um, in, and creativity, they think that I'm making machines that do all the creative work and kind of do all the fun stuff themselves. And actually I'm not that interested in machines being creative, I'm not that interested in machines um, replacing human creators. Um, instead, I'm really interested in how machines, and machine learning in particular, can support human creativity and human expression. Um, and a lot of my research looks at how can we do this. I'll show you some software I've built to try to do this. Um, my research also considers what the consequences of this might be, both artistically and practically. Um, and of course, there's an element of this asking, you know, who, who should or who can use machine learning? Hopefully, it's not just people who are computer scientists. Um, so you could ask these questions in lots of different artistic domains. In a lot of my work, I focus on domains where people are using sensors to build new types of art or music or interactions, things like new musical instruments or new games. Um, and it's an exciting time to be working with sensors, as many of you know, as you've seen in many of the fantastic pieces outside this room. Uh, we have motion sensors like Connect or Leap, we have biosensors, um, and these are giving us lots of rich information about what people are doing in the world or what's happening in the world. Um, we also have data that we all generate just as a, a fact of life in the digital age. Every time we interact with software or interact with our friends via social media, we can look at that as data that could potentially be used to artistic ends or used in self-reflection or other ways that are meaningful to us. Um, and there's a challenge here. One of the big challenges, if you've ever worked with this data, is that, you know what, sensors and data can often be practically very challenging. 
Um, even if you're an expert programmer or an electrical engineer, um, you may be getting many dimensions of data. This data might be noisy. Um, it may be really hard to connect, say, um, even the accelerometers in your phone to an understanding of what is somebody doing in space if they're holding that object. And that's a really simple example. So in my work, um, one of the things I use machine learning to do is to help people build new interactions with sensors and with data, not by programming, but by giving examples. So for example, I could say I want to build a hand gesture controlled drum machine or a hand gesture controlled video game. Um, I can give examples of, hey, here's one hand position and I'd like the computer to recognize it as a closed fist and play a sound or make my ga game avatar do something. And here's another example of maybe an open hand, and I want a different sound or action. And this turns the interaction design problem into um, a supervised learning problem. Uh, now, supervised learning algorithms are a very specific type of machine learning, um, where algorithms are tools for building models. Now, the model is the thing that we ultimately care about or may care about, where we can give it a new input, say a new hand position, and get a new label, maybe open hand, and then we use that label to go do something like play the right piece of music. Um, usually, as programmers, we make these models by hand, but if we use supervised learning instead, we can give a learning algorithm these examples and it'll build the model for us and hopefully it'll do what we'd like it to do. So in 2008, I started making some software that would allow musicians and artists to engage in this process of using supervised learning for their own fairly arbitrary ends. Um, and I built a tool called Wekinator, which I'll demo for you in about a minute. And the first thing Wekinator allows you to do is build up a data set, expressing to the computer what you individually would like it to learn. Um, and then you can build this model using the algorithm and try it out. And if you like it, great, it's yours. If you don't like it, you can actually go back to the data and correct mistakes or make something more complicated and so on. And so if anybody here has taken a machine learning class or done machine learning in a more conventional context, you know that these kinds of interactions of giving people total freedom to create training examples, try out models in a messy um, sort of unstructured way, and then go back and tr change the data if they don't like what the model does, these aren't really allowed in most conventional contexts. Um, but for various reasons, they make sense here. Um, and there's a whole thread that I could talk about. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, but I'm going to skip over these questions about how developing machine learning systems for creative use might actually look a little bit different than how we use machine learning in other contexts. Um, instead of going on about that, I'm going to do a demo, and we're going to make some sound. And um, I'll give you two really quick examples. The first one. Um, is going to use my laptop webcam as an input, and I'm going to build you a really simple sort of dance classifier. And I'm going to use that to control a drum machine, which, all right, great, we have a drum machine. Um, and I'm going to stick machine learning in the middle of these two things using Wekinator. And I'm going to start, I don't have an example set. This doesn't require big data. That just doesn't require someone else in the world to be, you know, have really seriously collected information about what dancing looks like. We're just going to build it here on the fly. And we're going to build it to do something quite personal and um, casual. All right, so I'm going to start with some example creation. And I'm going to tell it when I'm standing here, you can see it's, you know, messy, but yeah, a suitable representation of me. Um, when I'm standing here, when it sees these inputs, I want it to make this sound. So I've given it some examples, and when I'm not standing here, I want it to make that sound. And I'm going to build that model and run it, and it seems to be working pretty well. It's learned what I've wanted it to learn. I can try to get it to make a mistake somewhere. All right, so this is still me. I still this, want this to be the first sound. So I'll give it some more examples and retrain it and rerun it. And it seems to still recognize that as me now. And that's not me. And I can keep doing this. I can add more things like my hand and say, here's a new sound. That should be the hand sound. And now I have a hand recognizer. So that's one way of using supervised learning. Um, musically, this is kind of fun to watch, but um, I could achieve the same kinds of sounds just by pressing a button. 
So um, the next demo I'm going to show you is something that you couldn't really achieve easily without machine learning. And so this is my favorite synthesis algorithm. This is called Blotar, and it's got lots of different control parameters. You can think of this as sort of nine virtual sliders that we can play around with to get Blotar to make some sound. So here's one sound, lots of other sounds. All right, so Blotar can make a lot of sounds. If I want to build a musical instrument that controls Blotar, um, I'm going to need to think about how I want to control those sounds over time using some sort of um, maybe gestural input. And here I'm going to use um, a leap motion, which is going to capture information about what my hand is doing in space. And again, we'll just put machine learning in the middle. Once my, my leap motion fires up, you'll see my hand on screen. And now I'm going to give it some examples of hand positions and sounds. So I might say, here's, here's a sound. And I want that sound to happen when my hand is right here. And let's pick a totally different sound. And I wanted that to be like the claw hand. And I can train and gradually move between the two things. And that's pretty fun. I can add more sounds to it, maybe that sound, let's put that over here. Okay, so you saw that that suddenly I'm manipulating these nine dimensions pretty naturally without thinking about them as nine dimensions. I'm getting the sounds that I in initially put into that design, but I'm getting totally different sounds as well. And if I like them, I you know, keep them there. If I don't like them, I can change my data to get my model to do something else instead. So that's a really quick demo of Wekinator. It is open source and free, and you can go download it. Um, let's go back to my slides. Um, so as I said, I don't just build software, I'm also a researcher, and I'm really interested in how this and other tools can support human creativity and expression. And so I'm, in the, the rest of my talk, going to talk about some highlights um, from my research over the last eight years or so. Um, so the first um, finding, really, is that, yes, this is useful for the kinds of things that I hoped it would be useful for. Um, it allows people to build some really cool things with sensors. And I'm going to show you some examples of work that other people have done, um, beginning with a um, video by a composer named Anne Heggie. And this is a, a piece that she made using um, input devices here, which are actually PlayStation golf game controllers. But she's got performers moving with them in quite unusual ways. So you can find the whole video on uh, Vimeo. As you saw here, the performers, um, she very consciously chose a set of movements for the performers that resembles a, a yoga sun salutation. Um, and she had specific ideas about how she wanted mu music to be played as people moved in this particular way. Um, another one of my favorite composers um, who I've worked with is named Letitia Tsunami. I'm not going to play you this video, but she's made a series of pieces for this instrument um, called Spring Spire, which is a totally new creation of, a, of springs stretched across a metal frame, and she plucks and scrapes and moves these springs around to play sound. Um, Wekinator has also been used by a number of people who aren't musicians, not making musical work. Um, one of my recent favorites uh, was just featured in Motherboard. An artist named Chino Kim made um, some glasses that 
um, will turn opaque any time there's a screen in your view. Right? So this is using machine learning to identify things that look like screens and turning off your vision when that happens. Um, another really cute project is um, by someone named Andreas Refsgaard, who um, made a little facial expression to meme um, controller. So no matter what kinds of facial expressions you're making, it'll match it with an internet meme for you. And he's got a really fun video showing how he trains the system. So I'll just play a little bit. Again, whole things online. The last example I want to show you is a student project from a workshop I taught last summer. Um, this was an undergraduate student, I believe, who um, made a little robot with um, an Arduino and a little motor and a leap motion. And this is what the robot does. So it just waves at you. It's called HiBot. And I like this, you know, because this is something that um, the student was able to make in a couple hours, including cutting out all the paper and, you know, attaching the motor and everything. This probably isn't something that you would spend five months building, um, but it is something that is great to be able to build in an afternoon. And people really respond to it. Every time I show this, people go, oh, so nice. So um, beyond just the fact that machine learning makes working with sensors easier. There are some really interesting and I think profound consequences um, for the artists who have started using this type of machine learning in their work. And one of the consequences is that it's just really fast to build things, but that doesn't mean that people spend less time building things. So if you look at literature in design or talk to people who are making things in any field, whether it's paintings or making computer software, um, they will talk about the importance of prototyping, of starting out with an idea and building an instantiation of that idea as quickly as possible to test it out. Because it's really hard to have an accurate idea of whether something works if all you're doing is thinking about it. Whereas if you're holding it or you're bringing it into the world, into a social situation, or doing whatever it is that you might ultimately want to do, you can reason about it more effectively. And then you change it. And you change it because it doesn't work how you thought you wanted it to work, or you change it because you realize your ideas could have been better and you improve your ideas. And so we can think, look at machine learning tools sometimes as tools for rapid prototyping, which just by making things faster can improve artistic outcomes. Another really important aspect of designing with Wekinator, designing by example, is that it changes the act of programming from something that's all about mathematical abstract representations to something that's about being in the world, right? If you think about you know, how you would teach an alien from another planet what it means to wave hello, you're not going to write down a mathematical formula talking about how your hand moves in three-dimensional space. You're just going to say, it's like this. And if the alien doesn't get it, you'll be like, no, it's actually, no, just watch me, I'll, I'll show you again. Um, and so we have all sorts of embodied practices that are important to us as artists. For instance, um, the way that a dancer moves, the way that a musician plays, or the way that they sound when they express a particular musical idea. Um, and then we have other things that we'd like to build, that we'd like to interact with ultimately in a similarly natural embodied way. And machine learning can take the design process for those artifacts and make it look like this, right? Because when you're building HiBot, or you're testing HiBot, or you're debugging HiBot, this is also what you're doing is you're waving to it. Um, so again, I've talked to people um, who've used Wekinator in more serious projects, professional projects, um, and they talk about the importance of feeling the thing that they're making as they make it. Another really exciting outcome for me is watching machine learning open up new kinds of creative roles for people who hadn't necessarily um, thought about taking on those roles or planned to take on those roles. Um, Letitia Sonami, who I mentioned, who made the Spring Spire, talks about why she uses machine learning in her work and the way that it changes her 
role as the artist or instrument builder, and she talks about how, you know, for her, it's a political and an ethical and a creative decision to not want to feel like she's in an airplane cockpit when she's designing, where she just has this one great idea, and it's all about having the right buttons to make that idea happen. Um, she actually says, in a way, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You want it to be a little wild. You want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull. Um, and as you saw in the example that I gave with the leap motion and the, the funky sounds, I was adapting to it. I, I can't help but adapt to it as I move my hand around and notice, oh, that's a cool sound. I like that, or oh, I'm not sure I like that, but that's an interesting idea. Um, this is, I would argue, a little bit harder to do when you're building something by programming for various reasons. Um, the, last, the last thing I want to highlight, of course, is that Nobody has to have a PhD in machine learning. Nobody has to even be a programmer to use the tools that I demoed for you and make something effectively. I've worked with kids as young as eight years old, and with 20 minutes of a tutorial, they get it. They can build really cool stuff. Interaction design students can start prototyping with sensors and electronics much more quickly. They can do it on day one without necessarily learning the engineering stuff, and I think that's really powerful. Um, especially right now when we're in an age where most of the machine learning that happens in our lives is done to us, to the data that we generate. We have no say in how that happens. We have no control. We probably don't even know how our data is being used. I think it's really exciting to ask how we might give more people more tools to benefit from their own data. Right? Rather, that means making new musical instruments, might mean making accessible interfaces for people with disabilities. It might mean taking your data from your fitness devices or you know, other traces that you leave in the world and using that for self-reflection and so on. Um, so again, back to my motivating questions. How can machine learning support human creativity and expression? Hopefully, I've given you some new ideas that are a useful counterpoint to this idea that machines, we just want machines to be creative, and then we're not going to be left with anything to do. Um, and, of course, this is something that I believe should be usable by as many people as possible. Um, I'm still doing research on this, but I'm also doing a lot more teaching on this. So if this is interesting to you, and you're an artist or musician or designer, or somebody who says, you know what, that might be cool in a project I have planned, I have a, a free MOOC that you can take um, with the free software that I showed you and lots of other stuff. And I'm really interested, in, again, as a researcher, how can we teach these things to people who aren't machine learning researchers, who never want to become machine learning researchers, but have really cool ideas um, and are going to make things that are just different from computer scientists. So um, that is the end of my talk, and I believe we are time for questions. Thank you very much for presenting such inspiring projects to us. Kenrick, would you join us on stage? I think before the lunch break we have time for uh, maybe two questions. We run a bit out of time, I'm sorry. Here's one. Where's the mic? Thank you. Uh, my question is to Rebecca Fibrink. Um That was a great talk for both of you. I really enjoyed both talks. And um, I'm trying to follow the um, literature on interactive machine learning, actually. I'm a researcher in machine learning, too. Um, my question is, I'm sorry if I missed, if there is a publication and if I missed it, but did you run any study about long-term interaction? Uh, yeah, so the question is, did we run... Um, uh, there we go. Did we run any study about long-term interaction? I haven't done any really in-depth studies. I've done... I guess you could call them loose case studies, where there are a few composers, especially, who've been using this software for about six years or more. Um, I haven't written an update to the, the original case studies that I published on some composers in 2011. But um, no, I think that's fascinating. And again, one of the really cool things about interactive machine learning that I talked about is that um, allowing people to iteratively change models um, gives people a space where they can express the fact that they've been changed by what they've learned about the models. And there is very much this interplay between the things that people learn about machine learning and about the design space that they're working in and the ways that they can or, or maybe can't use that knowledge to change what they build. And I think this, this is an interesting set of questions, even outside the creative domain. Exactly. 
that's uh, okay. Uh, exactly, that's uh, what we know about musical instruments. And I was thinking the same. I, I was thinking if I have a model and as a musician, if I uh, practice that model, uh, what happens if I change it within time? Because we don't yeah. do that with musical instruments. I mean, we just we just have a piano, we play it, we choose one, maybe we change it or not, but we don't have chance to change one key at a time. Yeah, so there's some great questions there, and I'm happy to talk to you more about my, my views on that. Thanks yeah. a lot for that. Uh, there's another question in the back, the last question. Taking that car, taking that car example, who basically um, owns the art? Is it about the route you're taking? Is it about the idea to put the camera in a car that creates a book? Yeah. So, uh, in terms of how that's legally structured within the organization that I work for and with, um, the artist owns the IP in that case. So we don't, as Google or as Artists and Machine Intelligence, own the um, project or the IP. Um, there are some strict constraints around that in terms of uh, what we can contribute. And in that case, like we can't contribute engineering specifically, but Ross Goodwin did all the engineering himself. Um, so yes, like on a very prosaic level, that's, that's the answer. Um, but I think there are other questions that are, you're sort of poking out there, in, in particular um, the uh, question of IP with uh, training sets is a, is a sort of unresolved one, you know? And so like in Ross's case, he uses all uh, Gutenberg project texts that are sort of open source, I guess you might say, or copyright free. Um, but if there, there have been no legal precedents for somebody producing a, you know, derivative work that would be a neural net or, or output from a neural net, which would maybe be the derivative work of a derivative work. So that's sort of, in, we're in a new space there for sure. I fear we have to go into lunch break now. Are you staying here a little longer? Yes. So you're open for questions? Okay, great. Um, a big thank you to all the speakers that we had the opportunity to listen to today already. <laughs> big thank you to our interpreters again. <laughs> Don't miss the next session starting at 3 p.m., which will be chaired by Yuri Krupek um, on the topics of um, ethics, philosophy, and spirituality of AI. So that's going to be really interesting again. And now enjoy your lunch break, enjoy Ars Electronica, and hope you're going to have lots of fun and new insights here in Linz. <laughs>